Hey everyone, this is Eric Steinberg and Mustafa Syed. Welcome to the MRADS video series. Let's go. <laughs> now on to our second case of the month. 19 year old female with right lower quadrant abdominal pain times 12 hours. And another creepy poster. Where do you get these? That doesn't matter. It may be creepy, but it sends an important message. Don't gamble with appendicitis or use a laxative. <laughs> but what we really shouldn't do is make the gamble that all right lower quadrant pain is, is appendicitis. Especially in those people with the female parts. Let's go through the differential of lower abdominal pain. Here's a quick look at some common causes of lower abdominal pain from EMRA's Basics of Emergency Medicine. As you can see, there is a ton of pathology that can cause lower abdominal pain. As always, the key is to weed out the serious stuff and then move on to the common. Appy is the obvious concern for anyone with right lower quadrant pain. Other things to look for are presence of fever, nausea, vomiting, and McBurney's tenderness. Something that should be absent is hunger. To me, a positive cheeseburger at the bedside has pretty good negative predictive value for appendicitis. As does the positive cigarette break or the positive sunglasses sign, right? Exactly, man. Back to appendicitis. CT with PO and IV contrast remains a study of choice. Ultrasound may be obtained first, especially in the PEDS population, to avoid radiation. Hernia should always be a concern for these patients as well. Always, always, always pull down those pants and take a look at the inguinal region. It would be pretty embarrassing to miss a tennis ball sized strangulated hernia. And of course, your patient would conveniently forget to tell you that it's there. Diverticulitis usually presents with left lower quadrant pain, but it is definitely possible to have in the right lower quadrant as well. There's a classic board question regarding the Japanese population and sequel diverticulitis. Ectopic pregnancy is a must Get that Upreg right away. If positive, throw an ultrasound on immediately. This should be the first thing you think of with any female with abdominal pain and syncope. Torsion, whether ovarian or testicular, is a time-sensitive emergency. Time is testicle. You got it. Look for sudden onset pain, and I mean sudden onset, and get an official ultrasound ASAP. Now those are the very, very serious causes of right lower quadrant abdominal pain. Let's move on to the more common stuff. Ovarian cysts can be quite painful and are sometimes hard to differentiate from a torsion. Now unless they are massive and ruptured, these patients can follow up with their OBGYN. PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, is all too common and it is present in her sexually active pains with vaginal discharge and CMT cervical motion tenderness. This is usually a clinical diagnosis, which isn't all that great because we are terrible, and I mean terrible, at identifying vaginal discharge. Fishy? Frothy? Curdy? Who the hell knows? Just treat them and send them home. Now the exception to this rule is if you think there's a TOA, a tubo ovarian abscess, or if you don't think the patient will take her meds at home. In these cases, you may want to consider admission. Then there's Mittelschmerz. What an awesome word. I'm going to say it again. Mittelschmerz. Again, a diagnosis of exclusion and a patient with mid-cycle pain. UTI can definitely cause lower abdominal pain. Always dip the urine while getting the upreg and check for that CVA tenderness. Make sure your patient does not have pyelonephritis. Constipation. Ah, the very young, the very old, and the very opioid dependent. Encourage a high fiber diet, maybe some osmotic agents, an enema or two, or one of your intern's fingers can do the trick. Finally, a kidney stone or aortic pathology can cause abdominal pain anywhere, so always keep those two in the back of your mind. Always. Now some rarer things that may pop up in your career and more commonly on your exams is epiploic appendagitis 
and Yersinia infection, two things that can cause your pseudo-appendicitis. Now I know that was a lot, but eventually this should be automatic. So now that we have a dozen or so differentials in her head, let's go to the scan. Too much gyne, man. Once again, women making things complicated. Amen. For a vestigial structure, the appendix sure causes everyone a lot of problems. The biggest one being finding it. And no, you don't have to do five years of general surgery to get good at identifying it. Besides, why would anyone want to do five years of general surgery? Psh, beats the hell out of me, dude. So how do you find it? For the sake of everyone, the best thing is getting an optimal study. You need oral and intravenous contrast. Whether you administer it rectally or orally is up to you, but both contrasts help a lot. Practice makes perfect. You should get in the habit of tracing a large bowel. The best way to approach it is by putting your pointer on the area of interest and following it while scrolling. Some people trace from the rectosigmoid up, some people like to find the cecum first, whatever, just trace it. The key to finding the appendix is finding where the ileum terminates into the cecum. At this junction, there is a mushy, fatty, soft tissue density, which we all know as the ileocecal valve. This is where the contrast can help you, because you can see where the contrast is going in from the ileum into the cecum. The appendix is always located on the same side of the ileocecal valve, somewhere between the cecal apex, remember the cecum ends as a blind pouch, and the terminal ileum. Two-thirds of appendices are retrocecal, and one-third are inferomedial. Wow, two-thirds of appendices are retrocecal? What physical examination should we all make sure we're doing then? You got it, the psoas sign, which is pain elicited with passive right hip extension. So let's say you found it. Congratulations. Now you need to determine if it's normal or abnormal. The basic checklist for this is, is the appendix dilated? It should be less than 6 millimeters in diameter. Measure it every single time. It can have air. It can almost be flat. It may or may not fill with contrast. These are normal variants. However, it should not have fluid in it. The fat around the appendix should be clean and homogeneous. With, which means no variation in color. It should be significantly darker than the soft tissue because fat is much less dense. The borders of the appendix should be sharp. The walls should be a thin line. There should be a nice interface with the fat. Well-defined tissue interfaces are an important pattern to recognize in radiology. Okay, so if I had an appendix, I want my appendix to be less than six millimeters, I want no fluid in it, and I want no surrounding badness. I can handle that. I'm going to start by scrolling through some images I got for a normal appendix. This is a good example. I want you to try to find the points that we talked about before, identify some of the anatomy, and then we'll go through it again. So we're scrolling from the top down. Did you see it? Let's go through this. So let's identify some normal anatomy. This is your psoas muscle. This is your ascending colon. Now we're going downwards into the pelvis. And as you go down, you see some oral contrast right here. This is the terminal ileum. It's attaching into the colon, specifically the cecum. And you can see the contrast cross over from the ileum into the colon. And here, you have a soft tissue, mushy density, this is what we talked about, the ileocecal valve. Try to identify this, and with practice, you'll be able to get it on every CT. Now, as you continue down, again, you can see the contrast in the ileum and the colon, and you can identify the ileocecal valve. And if you come down further, what you'll see is the appendix come off the same side. Right here, see this little bubble? Follow it. And as you can see, it's air-filled and flattened towards the end, but right there, that's your appendix. In this case, it was a little more subtle, but sometimes it can be pretty tough to find. Just practice, and uh, you'll find it every time. Practice? You talking about practice? Here I have another example. The ileocecal valve is not included in this picture, but here you'll see an appendix. And there it is. It's very well defined. The walls are thin. It's tubular. It's full of air and the fat around it is not inflamed. And the point I want to make here is that it stays behind the cecum the entire time. So if you look right here, this is the cecum, this is where the appendix just inserted into it, and if you follow it out, 
This is a non-thickened air-filled structure. And it kind of terminates right behind the cecum. This is a retrocecal appendix. This example is to show you what mesenteric stranding is, or inflammatory changes within the fat. There are other findings here, but we'll go over them in the upcoming slides. What I want you to look at is the right image. Now I want you to look at the colon wall, and I want you to look at the fat around it. Look how different the densities are. The fat around the colon wall is almost black. Now if you look at the left image, you can hardly define the colon wall. And if you look at the fat, it's gray, it's hazy, there's some, there's some lines in it. This is inflammatory change. This is a result of edema and high blood flow because of inflammation. So this is one of the signs you should be looking for. So what causes appendicitis? Who knows? Who cares? Well, that's not entirely true. But a lot of times, it's just a finding. Sometimes you can see a cause. In this case, the appendix, right here, inserts into the cecum. Again, it's flattened. And then you come across this round calcified density. And then immediately following that, it's dilated. It's fluid filled. You can tell because of this low density. And the walls are fuzzier. They're not thin. And they're not interfacing sharply with the fat. So in this case, this is appendicitis secondary to obstruction from a fecalith. And this round, calcified object, this is the fecalith. This is your run-of-the-mill appendicitis. What I want to emphasize in this image is the difference with and without intravenous contrast. It is much easier to find the appendix with intravenous contrast. Here we have a few findings. You have this dilated tubular structure, which is full of fluid. This low-density material, where air should be, is fluid in this appendix. Again, the wall is thickened. And if you look around it, the wall is bright. And this brightness is what we call enhancing. So the rim is enhancing because the appendix is inflamed. And because of that inflammation, there's hyperemia. And that increased hyperemia manifests as this enhancement. If you look around it, the bowel should just be soft tissue seated in mesentery, which is fat. But here, you can't really see the fat. The fat is grayed out. And additionally, you see gray stuff right here beneath. And that represents free fluid in the pelvis. This is a much less dramatic case of appendicitis, but it is appendicitis. The appendix is dilated, and it is a little bit fluid filled, and the walls are thickened, and they don't interface well with the fat. However, there isn't a whole lot of mesenteric inflammation. You can see the gray in the fat still. So this is an example of early appendicitis. This is a much more dramatic presentation. Here the appendix is much more difficult to outline, and for good reason. You could probably find the origin if you scrolled on this image. But what you see here is a collection of stuff, right here and right here. Again, it has the enhancing walls that we talked about before, and additionally, it's stretching out across the fat over into the psoas muscle. This is a two-for-one. This person had appendicitis, it perforated, that's probably why you can't see the appendix, and now you're seeing this collection of stuff with enhancing walls and septations, this low fluid density and these bright densities around representing the enhancement. This is probably an abscess, and this abscess spread over into the psoas muscle. And you can see the psoas looks just like the appendix here. And over here, you can look at the normal psoas to kind of compare the difference. And this brings up an important point. Here we have an appendix, which is fluid-filled, thick, with a fuzzy wall, and fat stranding. What else do you see? The bladder. Notice the asymmetric thickening of the bladder wall on the left. Don't mistake this for cystitis. That could be possible. But in this case, it's much more likely that the adjacent inflammatory changes in the appendix are causing the bladder wall to be thickened. So some quick pointers. Abnormal appendix. A dilated, fluid-filled appendix measuring greater than 6 millimeters without the presence of oral contrast in it. The loss of a sharp margin with fat with enhancing thickened walls. Mesenteric stranding or fatty inflammation. Presence of a fecalith, that round calcified object we saw earlier free fluid within the pelvis, which may indicate a ruptured appendix, surrounding septated enhancing collection, which would indicate an abscess, or inflammation of adjacent organs. Remember to always look for free air. Oral and intravenous contrast should always be present. Save yourselves the guesswork. So, as Eric so eloquently touched on before, Thank you, thank you. The differential for right lower quadrant abdominal pain is large, but common things happen commonly. Check for stones in pyelonephritis, diverticulitis, and epiploic appendagitis. Inflammatory bowel disease, like Crohn's, can present with similar pain because of the proximity of the terminal ileum to the appendix. And, of course, the entire gynecology spectrum of pathology. Thanks, ladies. Huh. Well, that was great.
Thanks, Moose. You know, after a few of these videos, I don't think I'll ever need to consult a radiologist ever again. Yeah, right. We'll see about that. All right. Well, I know that we're pretty quick to scan or right lower quadrant pain patients, especially if they are tender. But, again, there is a helpful, validated clinical decision rule we can use called the Alvarado score. Again, this is especially important if we're trying to avoid radiation in a constipated child. As you can see, it takes into account signs, such as right lower quadrant or rebound tenderness, symptoms, such as migration of pain or anorexia, and lab values, such as white count and shift. Studies ruling out appendicitis using an Alvarado of less than three or four points have a sensitivity of 96%, which is pretty good. Studies ruling in appendicitis using an Alvarado score of greater than six or seven, have a specificity of 58 to 88 percent, depending on the study and the score cutoffs used. That's not so good. A large study in 2007 by McKay and the American Journal of Emergency Medicine recommends CAT scan for an Alvarado of greater than four, surgical consultation immediately for an Alvarado greater than seven, and no CAT scan for an Alvarado score less than three, as appendicitis is unlikely. As far as antibiotics go, the EMRA Antibiotics Guide recommends cefoxitin or cefotitan for simple appendicitis. Note that ciproflagyl, which we commonly use, is not included in their recommendations. For complicated appendicitis, which is gangrenous, perforated, abscess, phlegmon, or immunocompromised patients, the big guns are recommended. As far as appendicitis goes, the first thing you got to do is find the damn thing. And as Mustafa eloquently put, yes, we can look for the ileocecal valve and we can trace the colon. After we found it, we have to know what the badness is. Is it big? Greater than six millimeters? Is it wet? Is it fluid filled? Is it unshapely with ugly fat, non-homogenous fat, or bad borders? And finally, another evidence-based clinical decision rule we can use is the Alvarado score. And as we touched upon before, it has great negative predictive value, good for ruling out the appendicitis in certain patients that we can maybe avoid CAT scanning. It's the wild card! It's never that exciting. 54-year-old male with a recent dental extraction is now complaining of fever and neck pain and swelling. Here are his images. What could it be? What is the diagnosis? Well, the good news is you've got a month to figure it out. The bad news is you probably won't figure it out. Ha ha ha! Thanks for listening to us. We hope you found it useful. As always, we'd love to hear your feedback. Shoot us an email at emradsnyc at gmail.com. And stay tuned for our next episode, focusing on carpal fractures and dislocations, things we really don't want to miss. See you guys soon. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here?